Jackie, thank you so much for joining the Integral Chats. Congratulations on your new role at Sky, which is really, really exciting. And I want to touch on that a bit later on. But first of all, I wanted to take you back to when you first kind of discovered your love of football, because... I mean, when I first started going to football, I was about sort of seven or eight and, and there weren't any other girls there. So I'm interested to know kind of what sparked your interest. So I guess I'm a bit of a, of a strange case in quite a few ways, <laughs> probably. But mine wasn't the traditional dad or brother or uncle or next door neighbour. None of that. Nobody I knew was into football at all. And I went to an all girls school. Nobody talked about football. So that's the first thing. But I always loved sport. I was always obsessed with PE and any kind of sport. I loved watching on TV. So I'd watch golf, major tournaments, wall to wall. Yeah. The ones I particularly remember are Wimbledon and um, Olympics, any major tournaments. I'd watch all of it. Snooker, loved watching the World Snooker Championship. There's something yeah, magical. Yeah. There's something really magical about it. And I was so drawn in to all those sports. So I think it was an innate passion. Yeah. And my dad did love sport, but not football. And my brother still to this day has no interest in any of that. So it really came about from when I think I was ill on the sofa one day and the TV was on. And it was before the days of remote controls be. And, uh, <laughs> you couldn't be bothered to change the channel. Yeah, so I was like, oh, I'm not getting up. And there was a game on, I have no idea what it was. And um, there's only about one game a week on TV in those days. Yeah. And I just remember a, a switch flicked in my head that made me think, this is a sport for me. Mm. This is my sport. I just hadn't discovered it until that point. And I was really into hockey at school, playing hockey. I lived for that. We did one hour of sport a week, and that was PE. There was no after school clubs, nothing my kids are doing. My daughter does eight after school clubs <laughs> in seven days. Yeah. I keep, I keep saying to you, I have no idea how lucky you are. We couldn't do any of that. It was nothing. It was just, no. Sport wasn't a thing for girls, was it really, in those no, days? No, exactly. And, um, and so I just um, lived for my hockey and PE. And then this game came on TV and I was like, football, that's, that's it. Literally from that day, I've not been normal. <laughs> I've been a complete obsessive, just completely and utterly hooked and obsessed by this game of football at all levels. So I, I watched Champions League, commentated on Champions League, loved that. But really, that's not the essential football for me. Mm. I could quite happily watch Lincoln, Morecambe, non-league, literally anything. If I walk down the side of a road and a couple of kids are, are kicking a tin can around, I'll, I'll be sort of drawn like that. And my kids are <laughs> like, let me come. So it is, it is strange. I can't really answer why, but that's yeah. what happened. Uh, mine's completely different to that. I was surrounded by brothers and I had to go and watch them play. And it was over sort of Hackney Marshes, that kind of background. That's where my love of it came. Um, but you're right. I think when football gets hold of you, it's really difficult to fall in love with anything else. Um, and that's that's pretty much what happened to me. But it was different, I guess, when we were growing up. Um, I think I'm about a year or two older than you. but So you would have been a, around the kind of same time there, there weren't any other women to kind of look up to who were doing the roles that we ended up doing so you helped pioneer that female presence um you and I mean your career that is littered with first the first to commentate on, on national radio the first I think you were the first darts presenter on tv you were the first commentator female for match of the day so how did you think to yourself I I can do this when there was no one really to aspire to yeah, well, first of all, I didn't aspire to do it <laughs> because of the reasons you just mentioned. I didn't sit at home watching or listening or thinking, oh, I'd love to do that. There was yeah, no, oh, I'd love to work in football, which obviously I would have done, but I don't, I never joined the dots between my obsession, which is what it was. It, it was yeah. really quite unhealthy and it was what I, um, it wasn't unhealthy, it was just my passion, you know, and it was all consuming and the, the magazines, the newspapers, buying the pink on a Saturday at five o'clock from the news agent because we didn't have the internet, you know, studying CFAX for hours and hours and hours and pressing pause if your team was anywhere near the top half of the table. <laughs> but there was all that. And then it comes to university and decisions about that. And I was a year above, so I went to university when I was 17, so I had to make decisions when I was 16 I, I had no idea and 
it's nobody's fault that nobody suggested journalism languages were my thing I could speak mm -hmm. French and German and, and I love languages and, and now I'm, I'm I spend most of my time in my commentary prep making sure I get pronunciations right but so it was always language words grammar yeah same as me and sports mm. I never joined the dots my teachers never did nobody did and that's nobody's fault because yeah. we didn't see I don't remember I think there was Sue Mott who wrote nationally um there was Ellie Oldroyd on the radio a little mm -hmm. bit after that uh Juliet Farrington of course later on towards when I started but again I didn't really think I could be like them because I didn't have any self-confidence I wasn't somebody that thought I could conquer the world or you could do anything you want because I just wasn't I wasn't that I don't know maybe I wasn't that happy I just I think actually maybe because I was a year uh, younger than everybody in my class I think that actually really affected my confidence when I look back now in my 40s I can see that and go, okay that probably wasn't very healthy but that's really what affected me I think so fast forward a few years and I did a four-year German degree and I lived in Germany for a year had lots of adversity there in the sense of the people that I uh, lived with had some psychological problems and I had to try and stand up really and kind of grow up if you like which was brilliant yeah. for me to do that yeah and I came back as a did my final year 21 year old graduated what on earth do I do with my life yeah no idea so I know I'll go traveling for a year with a really good friend we had the best time we worked half our way around the year came back 500 pounds better off than I left which is a miracle wow um, worked really hard <laughs> clearly had a really strong work ethic in terms of actual work never did at school ever because I never really felt into anything mm. but as soon as I started working even in a call center I was really really hard working and I came back and again what do you do so it was it was one of those stories I don't want to tell you the long boring story but it was many many years later when I was 27 having had four and a half years in the grown-up workforce doing something I wasn't passionate about but that that's really when I thought well nobody's going to Nobody's going to ring me up and say, Jack, do you fancy working in broadcasting or journalism? But I worked out by then myself that when I heard people on the radio and, and Five Live was my thing, absolutely. And I, I listened to them all intently and had done with my little radio on the South Bank Terrace all those years. And I'd always been drawn to that. And I thought, nobody's going to invite me. I'm going to have to make this happen myself. And that's literally what I did right from scratch. Yeah. I didn't realise we had so many parallels because I did languages as well. Um, and I spent, my year abroad, I, yeah, yeah, I spent my year abroad in France. And then um, when I came back, I went into banking because I didn't know what else to do and I just wanted to earn money. And then I was 26 when I first got my job at Sky. So mm. it's, we've, we've kind of got a similar similar background there. Did you get your job at Sky then? You say you're in banking and you got a job at Sky. How did that work? I, basically, someone I knew knew the snooker producer. It was as simple as that. And um, I, I got an interview, got a job as a runner, took a pay cut to join Sky because obviously runners were earning nothing at that time. But as soon as I walked in the door at Sky, I just felt at home in, in the sense that it was just exciting. And you can imagine it was, um, when was it? 2000. So it's like 21 years ago and Sky was a completely different animal then. It was, it was more like being on Fleet Street, you know, it was kind of this budding broadcaster that was kind of breaking rules and, you know, smashing barriers and, and broadcasting Premier League football as well, which was still in its infancy then. So it was like a really exciting environment and obviously uh, the football, you know, living football every single day, it was just a dream come true. Um, now, so you said you were lacked confidence, but you'd obviously gained your confidence by this point. So when you got the opportunity to commentate um, for Match of the Day, I mean, at that time, it was a huge deal, wasn't it? Do you feel like it was just a little bit too early at that point? Possibly. I think if somebody asks you to do that, then you don't go, oh, I think maybe we'll give it a couple no, of <laughs> you, don't, you don't say no, that's for sure. You have to do it. But yeah. sort of in hindsight, do you think the, the, the male world just wasn't ready for that? Well, would they ever have been ready? No. Um, if you don't just do things. And don't forget at the time, I wasn't new. I wasn't wet behind the ears. I was 32. I wasn't mm -hmm. a kid. And... I'd worked my way up from hospital radio, evening courses, years post-grad studying 
journalism, broadcast journalism. I started in non-league football in West Yorkshire. That was my patch. I'd made contacts. I'd been to games lots of nights of the week. On my day off, I did uh, mm. the non-league at the weekend, interviewing people, getting the scores, ringing around clubs. So I'd literally taken every step and I started commentating in non-league. And then um, love my time at Radio Leeds and then Five Live, worked my way up there as well, always doing games and, and always doing commentary from Euro 2005, the women's Euros in the Northwest. And um, so I'd been doing radio commentary for a few years. And so when I was asked to do it, it wasn't a big grand gesture. There was no job. There was like, we'd like you to have this job. Like, unfortunately, <laughs> it was portrayed in some quarters. It was just, it was a nonsense really. And I genuinely didn't think, oh, why, why have they asked me? They asked me in the same way that they would ask other five live commentators to do a game and they still do now don't they they dip in they're primarily five live and occasionally they do a match of the day game so I didn't think of it as being groundbreaking or a big deal or a leap of faith or is the world ready for me I just no because as you know B you don't go on a gantry going I'm a female reporter so I need to make sure that I do things a certain way just no we've always been us we've got our backgrounds in football we've We've been to probably thousands of matches. I was trying to work out how many. It's got to be about a thousand that I've actually been to. Yeah, you know, I travelled home. The thing is, though, Jackie, people people don't see all that, do they? Yeah, I think they think you're just put there for that reason. Oh, she's blonde. She's a woman. Let's get her doing this because I wasn't prepared for the backlash when I first started doing match reporting for Soccer Saturday, and that was in 2012. So that was a few years later and I was shocked at how, you know, against it so many people were. But then obviously you had the social media aspect, so they could let me know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I like, like, thankfully you probably didn't have that experience at that particular time. But they just think you've been given the job, but just because you're a woman, they don't see all the hours, like you mentioned, that you put in beforehand. Yeah, and maybe, I don't know, I've never had the conversation with them. Maybe they did think it was time they had a woman. I mean, you know, I'm not completely stupid. Maybe they did think that they needed to make this less white male orientated. I don't know. And is that such a bad thing if they did? Hmm. Um, but had they come and plucked me from the office when I was sort of, I don't know, booking matches on a Saturday or whatever, and they went, oh, would you mind awfully commentating? Then yes, that would have been a problem. That's not what happened. But so I could see why you asked that. But I think, I think a lot of, I'm not, I have sweating about this to death and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I've always vowed that I'm not going to talk about this anymore because it's really boring because I have talked about it a lot. But just in answer to your question, I think partly the problem was that people didn't know me if they didn't listen to Five Live. Right, yeah. So so that week I discovered the huge difference between radio and TV right there. Never mind the different skill of radio commentary to TV, which is completely different. That's another matter. I noticed the, the difference in terms of the... Um, the exposure mm. that match of the day is clearly a flagship program. It's television it has an extraordinary amount of power. And don't forget, I'm, I'm somebody that had no aspirations to work in TV. I just mm. wanted to get down and dirty with football statistics. That was it, preferably on the radio, which is what I targeted. <laughs> yeah. And then I did some bits because in the olden days, back in TV center, you had the BBC news channel and five live sitting opposite each other. And, um, I was asked to do some bulletins and, you know, there was an obvious crossover right there while I was doing my five live. And then I was asked to present football and commentated on football. So women's football, that is. And so it all happened quite naturally, really. So, but I think, yes, in answer to your question, I think there was an issue that, because people didn't know me, I'm not sure it's the BBC's job to give me a profile first before I go on match of the day they they just asked me do you want to do a game and I said yes please and that was it back to radio the next week there was no I was doing sports sport matches for five live that week and as it turned out because of the furore I didn't have any time to do my prep for the game which is my massive regret that I was so lacking in sleep and because I tried to get back to everybody about you know their kind messages and interviews no thank you no thank you no thank you and of course I should have left everything to the following week so my main regret that week was not focusing on the game and doing the best job I could instead I was in this crazy days and I did my best but really I should have um, focused just on on the prep but so but you know what it happened we got over it the earth didn't shatter and lots of people actually 
very, very, very supportive. Loads of colleagues were really supportive and like, what on earth is going on? And um, so, you know, somebody has to be the first. So, so what? I've got quite broad shoulders. I don't know about thick skin. I've grown it maybe. Um, I'm quite philosophical and I've survived <laughs> and I'm here and more to the point, I think there are some excellent commentators now who just go on gantries and get on with it. Vicky Sparks, Robin Cowan, and I'm pals with a pair of them and they're just good at their job and they don't get any of that nonsense. They, it, it's good. It's just normal. The main thing is you shouldn't have to like somebody because they're female or male. You should just just evaluate whether you want to listen to them at all. Like we all do, we all have our favourite commentators and um, we particularly enjoy listening to them and others, you know, are fine too. And that's just life, isn't it? So I think the gender thing, I think some people are always going to have issues, but so what? Some people are always going to have issues with, with all sorts of people if they vote for Brexit or they don't and they vote for this party or they don't. And yeah. everyone's prejudiced about something, aren't they? No, absolutely. I mean, I've got favourite pundits as well. And, you know, it's, it's just a matter of opinion. It's it's whether you like this person or, or you don't. As you said, I mean, Sue Smith, for me, is one of the best pundits, male or female. I love listening to her. Emma Hayes, the same. I mean, she was absolutely amazing, wasn't she, this summer? So I think there will come a time when I, you know, we don't have to bring up these these questions. But it's interesting to to learn about your experience um, of it. And and so just now that you're you're now doing the WSL, which is another kind of big deal because it's the first sort of big broadcasting package that Sky has um, bought of the WSL, and now you're commentating as well. So. I did, I think, the the Women's League Cup in 2008. That was at Orient, and it was Arsenal-Everton. And I remember the production values then were tiny. Um, so I don't know how much that's changed. I mean, looking at the studios now, they look pretty plush, and there are touch screens and everything. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's, it's fantastic that Sky are doing that. And how much change have you seen in the women's game during the last few years? Oh, B, how long have you got, my love? How long <laughs> have you got? Honestly, it's um, it makes me so happy, honestly. Yeah. It's just, I'm so happy to be standing on purpose-built gantries such as Chelsea Women on Saturday morning. I was so excited. I, I tweeted a little picture going, look at this lovely gantry, it's gorgeous. And people at home were probably like, what? But for <laughs> me, it was just, it's just wonderful having... I don't want to compare it to men's football, but you may as well in this situation because they are doing it like for like. I mean, the team behind the WSL coverage on Sky are going full throttle. There's no, it's women's football, so we'll tone it down a bit. We won't give them that much. We won't put that in and we won't. No, they're, they're doing it properly. They've got really good people working on it. They brought in a new editor who is probably working seven days a week in the same way that I am on it and um, we all have our meetings you know Caroline and Lindsay just such a great team that we, we're we're really quite pally but we're you know, a little whatsapp group but we want to make the coverage better every week we're looking at something or I'll send an email in or Lindsay will send a feedback email in about whether it's facilities or floodlights or um, whatever it might be that we can try and make things better because the league's learning the clubs are learning they haven't always had full-time press officers perhaps and um, and so we're all striving to make it better but my experience so far having done it for just over a month has been wow <laughs> I've just dived straight into it I have to admit I haven't had a day off since uh, for seven weeks I had my first day off in seven weeks was Sunday um, and I ended up watching two WSL games and making lots of notes and texting Sue Smith all day about her game um but yeah, I can't help it because I'm just really immersed in it. So in terms of the the way the game has come on, the fact that it warrants such coverage from such a huge commercial broadcaster, it has to be said, yeah. who's paid the rights. And this is the first time rights have been paid for women's football. So previously it was more production um, fees that people were paid to broadcasters would pay, whereas this first time actual rights have been bid for. And that with it brings a responsibility from the people producing the product to make it as good as possible. So now we have full-time players, sounds daft, but hello, this didn't used to be the case. Full-time mm. players, they have head of medical science, psychologists, they have goalkeeper coaches. For good <laughs> they, you ask the goalkeeper, England goalkeepers of the past, they might have had somebody once a week if they were lucky, 
Yeah. They didn't have all this when people were taking the mickey out of them in the olden days when they were stacking shelves all week or working in the local uh, council or whatever their full-time was job was and then training a couple of nights on awful pitches with awful floodlights and expected to perform to a high level on a Sunday. So it has changed so much since I started going to my first game, which I think was 21 years ago. I think I went to my first women's game and then covered my first women's game in 2004. And that's when I've been... I covered it for Five Live all those years and BBC and went around the World Cup 2007 mm. and then was going to all the major tournaments every couple of years and the Olympics. And um, so it's, yeah, it, it has come on so much and there are, there's such a long way to go. That's the exciting thing about it. Women's football is still very much in the developmental stage in this country because of the reasons we know about them being denied the chance to play and the coaching and the, mm lack of professionalism mm -hmm. that's fine that happened that's gone now this is where we are this is where the investment is sponsors are interested they fancy a part of it because that's great. these athletes are people who they want to invest in put their money in and now we've got to make sure that we create a culture we have to generate a brand new culture because when you were talking about your time growing up b you had brothers uncles everybody going to west ham that mm -hmm. was the culture from a century or so ago mm. there hasn't been that culture in women's football until now and I think with ticket prices being 20 quid for a family of four to go to Chelsea to watch the top players in mm. Europe some of them like hello I think people need to switch on to the fact that you can go to women's football have an amazing day out see top class sport an actually enjoyable experience as well mm. and um and it's cheap as chips so let's get people buying tickets and the clubs need to be doing their bit You've sold it. How, how well received has it been so far, do you think? And what do you think this will do for the next generation of young girls who haven't had this opportunity before? I think it's huge. People always talk about if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I've talked to my pal Faye White over the years and loads of that generation, Sue Smith's generation, Kelly Smith, who... Um, when they were growing up they didn't know there was an England team they didn't know there was an England team yeah let alone could they become professional and Kelly Smith as we know had to go to America to be professional she didn't want to she had lots of problems as a result um it's it's very sad that there was that generation lost because of the lack of opportunities um but now little girls my age much younger she's 10 but can go to Wildcats girls age 5 to 11 to put their postcode into the FA website and find a local club where they just want to train or yeah. actually have a team. They can just go meet new friends, girls only. It's incredible they can do that for mm -hmm. pittance, you know? And so, yes, if they're watching, watching these players on TV, BBC One, BBC Two, Sky, um, and even DAZN are streaming the Champions League for free, top players in the world are doing that, uh, are available there. So they can see it. Of course, the England games now on ITV4 as well. It's all terrestrial if they want, or you know, Sky Sports doing what we're doing too. So it has to, it has to encourage young girls. If they're playing well on a Saturday, they've got the bug. They want to go along to a local game, not just uh, WSL, but there's championship, there's the leagues below that as well. Go and mm. watch, go and enjoy it. And then there are options to get proper coaching from very good centres of excellence if they show any talent and aptitude. Part of me just feels a teeny bit jealous that it wasn't around when I was growing up. I was like, oh, I'd have loved that, but I'm so pleased for them, I really am. And just finally, um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to ask you, with the roles that we do, I don't know if it's easier to get into now or tougher because so many people want to do it. The industry has kind of just exploded, hasn't it? Online, broadcasting, radio, YouTube channels. There are so many kind of little avenues you can get into. Um, apart from the, the main things like doing a journalism course or something like that, how would you advise young people who dream about doing the kind of job that you do? Well... There's a lot more competition now in the sense that lots of people feel they can do the job and that's great if they have the confidence and they're able to see that they can apply to do things. But I think the main thing is really just doing it. Um, there's a, a good podcast series that I've been listening to. I'm actually I'm actually going to be um, chatting to Ian Danter this week on it, but lots of podcasts, uh, 
commentators two a week uh, are talking about their experience. And one of them, Kevin Hatchard, who's on there, talked about spending hours and hours and hours and hours and hours at home growing up with um, tape recorder, watching games on the TV, recording his commentary. And he took that to university as well. So by the time he ever applied for anything, he had hours upon hours upon hours upon hours of tape of him having done it and he got to listen back and practice and practice. So this is one of my main messages to people who are thinking about coming through. Don't wait and then go to school and then at the end of it, apply for stuff. Anyone can do that. What you have to do is set yourself apart from everybody else by actually doing it. And you don't have to be given permission to do it. All you need is, oh, what are these things? What are these creatures? Not two kids. Don't, don't have two kids. That's a terrible idea. That, that's much harder. <laughs> Do it without kids. It's much easier. Um, but what are these things? And uh, watch a game on the telly, on TV. You don't even need to just commentate or do match reports or put yourself in the position of, say, it's BBC London. Okay, what do they do? Do they do 20 second goal updates and do it? Have in mind whether you're doing radio or TV. I would strongly advise radio because you're far more likely to start in radio than you are TV. But you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. But actually, do it. That's my point. Do it. Record, write match reports, write opinion pieces, write, write, write. Get people to read them. Send them to people. Mm -hmm. um, get people to listen back to your commentary and ask them to be honest and just say, okay, will you keep repeating this word or you keep saying the same thing or actually are you doing it for TV or radio? Or I don't know. Decide if it's a radio or TV audience. Don't just talk over goals and be clear as to what you're doing it for and then keep doing it, keep practicing. Once you found something that you think, okay, I think I did that quite well. And once you get a little bit confident, I mean, you could be starting doing this when you're eight, by the way, you don't have to be 16, 20, you could be 30. Like I was, 27 when I did my postgrad and 28 when I finished it and started um, from scratch and but I think actually doing it sets you apart from other people who want to do it and think they could be this or think they could be that given the opportunity well don't wait actually do the practice yourself and don't go I just want to do radio or I just want to do tv or I just want to do print because really you need to be able to do everything ideally to make yourself more employable Sure. And then once you've done all that, then um, ask if you can ideally speak to somebody, get in front of somebody. You could use Zoom, which doesn't cost you anything. And you could ask somebody for a five minutes chat about their career or about their what did they do in their office? What what happens there? What's the sort of work they do? And then when COVID regulations are a little less restrictive maybe now even then ask if you can go in and spend half a day half a day there or can I come and answer the phones for your phone in actually do things don't just wait don't just talk about doing it actually do something take steps email people ask if you can see them don't ask for a job don't ask for a job whatever you do don't say I want your job that'll really put them off <laughs> do make steps to say could I come in and see what you do because once you're in front of people even now on zoom once you're in front of people people can see you and go okay I like that kid's attitude or I like his work ethic or I love the fact that she's so keen to start at the very bottom and and work her way up and um, that way people know you for you rather than just some faceless person on email or, or don't tweet people asking for work experience that's the worst thing people tweet asking for things and people don't respect it because they haven't made much effort so yeah. track track them down and find out how you can actually get a letter to them or or just um speak to them somehow that's brilliant advice, Jackie. Thank you. And thank you so much for talking to us today on the Integral Chat. It's been lovely. Thank you, B. I've enjoyed your, your other ones that you've done. Great stuff. Thank you.